Hallelujah. Greetings to all of you in the master's name of my Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm happy and excited. After one year, we are back in St. Paul's. And it's been a long journey for both of us. Swapna and I have been traveling since March 14. We've been to Australia for meetings in Sydney, Brisbane, and Melbourne. From there, we moved to New Zealand. In the four cities of New Zealand, we were in Auckland, Wellington, Palmerston, and Hamilton. From there, we landed uh, in the great country of America in April, and we've been traveling from San Francisco, Denver, Chicago, West Plains, and now we're here. We have one more month uh, in our journey before we go back to India. And we are so happy about being here with you all, especially my brother George and Chitra and their family and the lovely people here. God bless you all. And as we come in God's presence, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst. So what makes the difference in our meeting is God's presence, that he is here with us. So if we have come this morning to see him and worship him, Let's pour out our hearts before God, open our minds so that God can touch and bless each one of us. The portion that we read from Philippines uh, was rejoice in the Lord always. And I, again, I say rejoice. So God has been putting this in my heart last couple of weeks. This was to rejoice in God always. I would begin, begin with Nehemiah. Chapter 8, verse 10. Here we find Nehemiah building a broken wall. Nehemiah was not a builder, but God decided to take him. That was not his profession. Sometimes you may go have to go away from what you are regularly doing when God's call comes. So Nehemiah was called to build a broken wall. God wants to build the brokenness. He is a God who builds the brokenness, the nothingness, the emptiness. You know, when I landed in in New Zealand, in, in, uh, in Australia, in one of the meetings there, I spoke about the gift of emptiness or the gift of brokenness. Because God can only fill into empty vessels, not ones who are full and have everything. So if you are empty today, God is ready to put something into your heart. If you know everything and if you have come here just like that, uh, you will not even, one drop will not go inside. But if you're empty, God is able to fill you. So here we find Nehemiah trying to build a broken wall of the city of Jerusalem. And what is this verse? Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. Shall we see that verse? Yeah. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So this day is holy for the Lord. Do not grieve. In the New Testament, every day of our life is holy to God, not Sundays. Many of us are Sunday Christians. Mondays to Saturday, we are in the world. We live a diabolic or a two different lifestyle. <laughs> But for us as believers, every day is holy. And this is the day which is holy to the Lord. So what is most important? Do not grieve. If there is any grieving soul, a grieving mind, it is the commandment of God that you don't grieve. Because the Father in heaven is so loving, he doesn't want you to grieve about anything in life. We don't realize that importance. We don't take it seriously. We hurt God when we grieve within ourselves. God is saying, do not grieve. Don't grieve. The devil is the one who wants to wound your heart. He is the one who wants you to cry. He is the one who wants you to remain in brokenness. He is the one who likes to keep you empty. God wants to fill you. God wants to mend the brokenness. God wants to repair the whole thing. He says, do not grieve. This is a holy day. And if you don't grieve, you have to be very careful. You can't be a passive person. means neither too hot nor too cold in between. Either you're grieving or you're happy. There's nothing like a bland man. 
Is there a planned emotion in our life? Oh, who? Now, this is this verse very clearly says the joy of the Lord is my strength. strength. The theological education is my strength. The neurosurgical practice I have done so many years is my great strength. I can speak. There are some people who told me, next message you should tell us about how to open a brain and speak about that. Uh, you know, it doesn't help you anyway. So, even though I like to share our experiences in the operation theater, but it's more important to share the kingdom of God. And the most important thing which is our strength is the joy of the Lord. Let me ask you, do you really have the joy of God in your heart this morning? When somebody sees you, is that the flying thing? Is that what hits? When I was in Ludhiana, Christian Medical College, doing my residency, one of the most difficult times of my life, very difficult, nobody to talk to, nobody to encourage you, everybody to pull you down, everybody to crush you, everyone to command you, everyone to discipline you, everybody to teach you, everybody to control you. There's nobody to encourage you. It was at that time I was taking care of a very sick person in the hospital, in the intensive care units, in my surgical intensive care units. And the man who was next to him called me and he said, hey, come here. He's an orthopedic patient. I said, yeah, what is, what is it? I said, good morning, how are you? He said, you have something which I don't have. I said, what is that? No, you have something which I don't have. I said, that's Jesus Christ. I didn't know what this man, made this man ask me this question that you have something which I don't have. So I said, Jesus, yes, tell me more about Jesus. I said, why did you ask me that question? He said, your face is always full of joy, which is not ordinary, which is something supernatural. I see you struggling. I see you working hard, but you have that overflowing joy in your heart. You're not looking at the situation. I shared my life, my experience, my testimony, how I got healed as a hydrocephalic baby. I called in all his relatives into the ICU. We had a good time there. And he said, I am an orthopedic surgeon from Amritsar. I am retired. I have family and friends. I'm going through this tough time. But you have something which is which I don't have. So if you have Jesus in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit. And if you have Holy Spirit in your heart, you have the joy of God. What is the kingdom of God? Kingdom of God is nothing. It's not eating and drinking. It is peace, love, righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and the joy of the Holy Ghost. So that's why we read from Philippians today, and we read all the portions. I wish I could go from each verse, but I will just stick with verse 4, Philippians 4.4. 4. Let me repeat again. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. It is repeated twice. Why did Paul have to repeat twice? Because by saying once, we will not rejoice. This is interesting because this epistle is written from the prison. Prison is not a place to write epistles or stories or gospels or, you know, good things. If creative people like in the riverside, mountainside, maybe in the St. Paul's atmosphere, you can write books here. It's a beautiful place. I love this place. I love to come here again and again. What a beautiful campus you have here. So you can be very creative because the atmosphere is creative. Prison is not the place where you can be creative. And from the prison, in the bondage, in the toughest time of St. Paul, he is saying, rejoice in the Lord. And again he is saying, <coughs> again he is repeating, and again I say, rejoice. If you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, you know, St. Paul has gone through all the epistles and he wants to teach this particular portion very emphatically and very clearly that none of your life should be filled with sorrow. Even when you are in fire, 
like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were in fire, but they were not burnt. They didn't get the smell of the fire. The hair was not burnt, only the ropes were burnt. Why were they not upset in the fire? Because they had the presence of the Son of God there. They were not afraid. So even in fire, they were comfortable. They were happy. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, we read, Rejoice always. Rejoice always. My translation says, Rejoice evermore. Have you read that portion? In that translation, I love that translation. Rejoice evermore. That means as you age, you have to rejoice more. <laughs> Why did God say rejoice evermore? Because children are all, always joyful. You find the children playing, laughing. And as you go to the elderly, as I came to America, I visited many, many elderly home centers this year. I never saw anybody laughing. They were trying to put TV, music, they were entertainment, they have arranged many things, but all were very serious. You come to a church, you find serious Christians. They think God is always serious, not laughing. You know, if you can laugh, you will be successful. If you can laugh today, you are going, all your bones are going to be healed. If you can laugh and enjoy the presence of God today, you are going to gain something. So that's why it says, rejoice evermore. You have to grow in joy. As we grow older, joy should not disappear. It should increase. Rejoice evermore. For this is, what does the verse say? Rejoice evermore. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is the will of God for you this morning. Woo! Rejoice evermore. For this is the will of God for you this morning. Don't look around the surroundings. You know, why are you so depressed? Because you are looking into yourself. I like that verse in Philippians which says, Rejoice in the Lord always. It doesn't say re rejoice in the children always. Because if you are rejoicing in your children, someday you will cry. It didn't say rejoice in your degree always. Because if you are rejoicing in your degree, you will cry someday. Rejoice in your power, power and position. No, you will cry. Rejoice in the Lord always. This is the will of God that you rejoice in Him. Are you happy this morning? What is the fear in your mind? What is that is making, stealing your joy out of your heart? You know, devil is very good at putting some things to steal the joy out of your heart. In the presence of God, there is happiness. There is joy in the presence of God. Where, is, where do you find joy? It is in the presence of God. Let's go back to Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 43. And uh, uh, we find that the, only in the presence of God you can have joy. Many of us go for movie, for entertainment, to have happiness. Happiness cannot be brought from Walmart. You don't get joy around anywhere. Happiness cannot be bought by drinking alcohol or by any drugs. It will destroy you. Joy is not in any, any of these things. Nehemiah 12, 43. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. God gave them great joy. So why are you not joyful? Because you're not asking God to give you that particular experience. God gave them joy. God does not give you hurt feelings. God does not want you to cry. It says, those who are burdened, heavy laden, come unto me, I will give you rest. If you are tired, come unto me, I will give you rest. God doesn't want you to be in trouble, in fear, in brokenness, always. He wants you to be meant. He wants to be, you to be ready, repaired. For, for the use, he, he gave them joy. He gave them joy. And then what happened? The women and children also rejoiced. Women and children also rejoiced. The whole crowd, everyone rejoiced. God wants the St. Paul's to rejoice. When Paul and Silas were singing in the prison, that is the time when the chains broke open. That's the time when prison door opened. It's when you worship when you praise, 
when you rejoice in the presence of God, all the devil has put in your life will be broken, shattered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, I love to say hallelujah. I never stop saying hallelujah. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. If a hydrocephalic baby can be saved and made into a neurosurgeon, I will continue to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Despite the situation, not that everything is right always in your life. No, you pass through the valley of the shadow of death. I love that verse. When you pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For the Lord is with me. It's not written, you stay in the valley of death. When you pass through. You're just passing through. It's only temporary. Your fears are not permanent. Your problems are never forever. It is only for time being. Get out of it. Shake out of your shackles and come out rejoicing. And mend yourself and rectify. And come into the presence of God and be, be happy. If you want to live long, let me tell you, you don't have to have vitamin A, B, C, D, E, U. Rejoice in the Lord. It has been scientifically proven that people who are happy live longer. If you want to be creative, be happy. If you want to be successful, be happy. If you want to be productive, be happy. The moment the joy goes out of your life, you cannot be productive. You know why children fail in some subjects? Because they hate the subject. Or sometimes they hate the teacher. So they feel. If you hate something, you cannot be productive. You cannot enjoy it. Psalms 5.11. You have to fall in love with the sea. I, when I went into medicine, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, it's all tough subjects. Medicine, surgery. But I passed in five years, first time, first shot, good marks. Because I love the subject. If you love it, you will enjoy it. When you enjoy, you will be successful. If you really love God this morning, you will be rejoicing in His presence. Do you really love Him? Or it's only just by words? Are you able to rejoice in, in God's presence? Psalms 5 verse 11. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Let those who love your name rejoice in you. Let those who put your trust in God rejoice in him. When you put your trust in God, when you love his name, that is when you are going to rejoice. And in Psalm 16, 11, it says there is fullness of joy. See, without God, there is no joy. There's nothing called darkness. Darkness is absence of light. There's nothing called cold. In physics, if you study, cold is absence of heat. There's nothing called sorrow. Sorrow is absence of joy. So how do you get over your sorrow? Fill it with joy. That's why I say rejoice in the Lord always. It's a commandment. It's the will of God. Listen to me, whoever you are, whether from the TV program or wherever you're going to listen, God wants you to rejoice. Devil wants you to be in the depth of that pit crying, saying you, everything is over, everything is finished. No, it's not over. It's only beginning. Yes, let's read Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. You will fill me with joy in your presence. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. People are seeking for pleasures in the world. Let me tell you, there's no pleasure in this world. Drugs cannot give you pleasure. Sex cannot give you pleasure. The movies cannot give you what you're looking for. The job cannot satisfy you. Money cannot satisfy you. Eternal pleasure is in the presence of God. Amen. There is fullness of joy. Let me tell you a secret. More time you spend alone with God, your face will start shining. You won't need fair and lovely after that. You won't need any makeup. You won't need base foundation. You won't need other creams in the morning. You will be coming out shining because you are spending time in the presence of God. There is fullness of joy in the presence of God. Why did I read this? Because
because I want to tell you there's something called partial joy, part-time joy, at times joy, in between joy, sorrow mixed with joy. It's like salad. Many things are mixed together. Our life is like a fruit salad. Sometimes there are bitter fruit and you know, it's not like full of joy. Yesterday we had a, not a watermelon, cantaloupe. And every bit of it was juicy and sweet. There was no sourness in that. In the night when I went to bed, I was just thinking how that fruit was. It's a small thing, you know, you must enjoy the small things and little things in your life. Whether it be a fruit that you eat. There's fullness in the presence of God. The fullness of joy. Psalms 27 verse 6. six, six. He teaches another aspect of joy. Christian joy is different. The spiritual joy is different. The joy of the Holy Ghost is different. That's why this lesson is very important. It is not the joy that we see outside. It is the joy in partaking with God. Uh, Psalm 27 verse 6. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. Yes. Then my heads will be lifted up above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. Sacrifices of joy. How can you have a sacrifice of joy? Sacrifice is always with crying. No. Sacrifice is with crying. How can sacrifice be with joy? Think of Abraham who was clown climbing the Mount of Moriah. Was he crying and going? No. He was going for a sacrifice of his only son. But he was going joyfully to do the will of God. Sacrifice of joy. Joyful at situations when you want to give up something for Jesus. When you are suffering for Christ. That is sacrifice of joy. 1 John 1 4. There is something more important that we need to learn about the joy in the presence of God. Yes, 1 John 1 4. Sacrifice of joy. This is something which we need to understand. That sometimes we need to tell ourselves to be happy. Yes, 1 John 1 4. We write this to make our joy complete. Yes, our joy complete to make our joy full. Israelites were coming. They were traveling through the desert. They came to a place called Mara. What does Mara mean? Bitterness. What does Mara mean? Bitterness. Bitterness. So what is the first encounter these people had? Mara, bitterness. But Mara was not permanent. What came immediately after Mara? Elim, springs, joy. You must understand Mara is not permanent. Don't call yourself Mara 24-7 till the end of your life. No, you may pass through it, but pass it quickly. Go ahead, come to Elim. Tend that Elim, where the springs of joy is there. In Ecclesiastic chapter 2, verse 26, you know, life, I know, I, I, I sometimes wonder, how in life can you rejoice all the time? Is it practical? How in life can we be joyful always? You know, you question yourself, I question myself, but we learn that when we are filled with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit Spirit of God gives us the strength to be happy. Ecclesiastic 2.26 To the person who pleases him, yeah. God gives wisdom, knowledge and happiness. God gives wisdom, knowledge, happiness. Not money, power and position. That's what we are looking forward. These days they say come to the church and you will have all the blessings and prosperity. You will get everything. Doesn't matter. But here to the one who pleases he gives what? Three things. Wisdom. Knowledge. Knowledge and happiness. and happiness. Three things that God gives. Let me repeat again. Happiness and joy is God given. Not man made. Not self made. Not, not you cannot produce it in the kitchen. You cannot manufacture it in the factory. You cannot do it yourself. You have to receive it from God. God has to give it to you. And it's very interesting, you know, what the right next to us, next to us. But to the sinner, to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth 
to hand it over to the one with Jesus. Hard work, 24-7, working for money. All promotions, all hard work is not gift of God. It's a devil who keeps you chained in some places. You know, you think it's all good, the will of God. Yeah, I've got a job, I'm here, you are there. No, 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 no. You have to find out. When God gives you, he gives you with peace. He gives you with joy. He gives a sinner to work hard so that he will give it to the one whom he likes when he pleases. So when Ambani and Adani is rich, don't be jealous. It is for you when you need it. Hallelujah. I'm talking about two rich people in India. I don't know who that equivalent here. But let, that's just in passing. First Peter chapter 4 verse 13. You know, sometimes we get very upset when somebody is so rich or doing well. Don't get upset. That's all for your good. Because you don't have to work so hard. God will give it to you. You know, when I was in Australia and New Zealand, I was traveling always in Benz and BMW and Jaguar. My whole life I've never done that. My friends had bought it and kept it and here I was enjoying in Jaguar and uh, Benz and BMW. Good. You know, you got to make somebody work hard for you to travel in that wonderful. You know, just thank God when your friend has a good car or a, your neighbor has a good house and somebody is doing well. That's good for you. In Canada, when a farmer repeatedly got the first price for the best corn, you know what he did after the price? He gave the seeds, the best seed he had to the neighbors. Everybody questioned him. You have the best seed. And next time you are not going to win because you are sharing your seed, best seed with your neighboring farmers. You know what this man said? If I give them the bad seed, it will pollinate into my farm and I will use the quality. So I want my neighbors to be the best. How many of us can think like that today and rejoicing in God, rejoicing in all situations, rejoicing in somebody else's goodness, rejoicing that God is good with you. Well, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 13. This is the other part. I'm coming to the latter part towards the end uh, where I want to teach you something better. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 13. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. No, don't read this verse today. This is not. Till now it was good. Now how can you say rejoice? What did you, what did you read just now? Just read again. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. When you participate in the suffering of Christ. Oh, that is the message I was looking for. That's why I thought I was really suffering. You know, most of the suffering is man-made, not participating in Christ. You are suffering for the sins you have done, the mistakes you have made, and don't blame it for suffering for Christ. Suffering for Christ means suffering for the gospel only, for the cross. Not every suffering you have is suffering for Christ. Now this message turns out to be something different. Oh, participating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is true. I never knew that the suffering that God gave is participating in uh, Christ's suffering. No, 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 no. That some of the suffering that you're going through is you are creating it. You have to positively get out of your suffering. You have to positively get out of your pit. You have to make sure that you don't remain in the suffering that you have created. But this is suffering for the gospel. Let's read that. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 13. But rejoice as much yet. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Rejoice as much as in when you are participating in the suffering of Christ. Yes. So that you may be overjoyed. So that you may be overjoyed. When his glory is revealed. <laughs> when you are when you're going to see the glorious day when second coming of Christ. You know, I have one, one day more closer, one year more closer to the second coming of my Savior. Am I not excited? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Everything that I do is for the kingdom of God. When you focus yourself on Jesus and Jesus alone, your joy will increase. It will be contagious. It is something uncontrollable. You don't have to be taught to be joyful because the Holy Ghost is joyful. Suffering for Christ is great because we have something in treasure in heaven. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 3, we read about Jesus. You know an example that I want to read this morning with you? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, sorry, 2. Hebrews 12, 2, we find, yeah. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. I have repeatedly said this. 
not looking on Sundays to Jesus, fixing our eyes. Like last year when I came, these lights were fixed here. It didn't change. It doesn't change once in a while. It's fixed there. You know, sometimes our eyes are fixed on the job, our sickness, our children, our problems. Here it says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Yes. The pioneer and perfecter of faith. Oh, in mine was order and perfecter. A good pioneer and perfecter, but I prefer order. Because I keep reminding people, allow Jesus to write your story, then it becomes his story. If you allow Jesus to write your story, then it becomes his story. You want to have a history? Allow him to write it, it becomes his story. His story is nothing but his story. Jesus between AD and BC. He is the author and perfecter of your faith. Next verse, yes. For the joy set before him. For the joy set before him. He endured the cross. He endured the cross. Jesus endured the cross, seeing the joy set before him. What was the actual joy that was set before Jesus? It was the church, the bride, you and me. <laughs> By seeing us, he went through the cross. Isn't that interesting? That God, Jesus, Son of God, suffered everything for us because of the joy that was set before him. So when you suffer for Christ, don't be upset, don't complain, don't mumble, but count it all joy. James chapter 1 and 2 says the same repeatedly. James also wants to join with the other epistle to teach you. Peter and James are telling you these things which are very important that we know when we talk about the joy of the Holy Ghost. And what is actual joy? Uh, James chapter 1 verse 2. And sometimes we may misunderstand the meaning of joy. Yes, James chapter 1 verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many times. Yes. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Testing of your faith produces perseverance. Yes. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. And so that you become mature and complete like Jesus. God is preparing, the Holy Ghost is preparing a church which is mature and complete like the bridegroom. So all the trials that we are facing, all the situations, all the problems, all the issues that we are going through, we mature out in that and become perfect like Christ. You know, Moses was a very hot-tempered man. At the end of the day, he became the most humble man. There was a point in my life when I was a very hot-tempered man. Now, maybe you have to stimulate somehow for a couple of days together for my whole temper to come. It's crucified with Christ. You know, we need to learn to rejoice in God and change situations. Romans 14, 17. I'm coming to the last bit of my message. Romans 14, 17. Romans, uh, Paul is teaching something very important in the book of, epistle of Romans. Uh, chapter 14, verse 17. What does he say? For the kingdom of God. This is what I said before. For the kingdom of God. Is not a matter of eating and drinking. Eating and drinking. I started with Nehemiah. I said, go home and eat and drink. After the Sunday service, please go home, eat and drink. I know some of you have come even without a coffee in the morning. So go back happy and rejoice because God has told you to rejoice in God. Don't look at the situation in the morning. Uh, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. But what is it? But of righteousness. Righteousness. Peace. Peace. And joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy Spirit. in the Holy Ghost. That's why I wanted to read this portion, joy in the Holy Ghost. Why are we missing the joy? Because we are missing the joy, Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, your life with, without Holy Ghost is a zero life. Absolute zero. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And that triune God, it started with Trinity as three. But the first God, Godhead that was spoken is God the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God was hovering over the water. And if you see, everywhere and anywhere, before things happened, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and things happened. Jesus came to the world. It is the Holy Spirit that takes the word into your heart and makes it work. 
So the joy of the Holy Ghost is very important. If you are not filled with the Holy Ghost, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And this filling of the Holy Ghost is a daily experience. Some people think it's a one-time experience. No, it's a daily experience. Because you drain out on your way. You need to get filled. That's why it says, ask Him. Ask your Heavenly Father and He will give you more of the Holy Ghost. So are you having more of the Holy Ghost than last year? I can challenge you. I can tell you. I am more filled than what I, when I came in 2018 here. Don't you see that? Don't you see the difference in the message I gave? I'm absolutely sure because I know I've been drinking. Have you been drinking? Be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's most important. The joy of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 13 verse 52, the church grew only because of the Holy Spirit. Not because of theology. Not because of strategy. Not because of planning. Not because of set of actions. It is only by the Holy Ghost. And how do you do that? By waiting on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew them. It is on the knees. It is in the presence of God that we get the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 13 verse 52. Acts 13 52. Here we find a secret of the church. In the Pentecost. Church started with Pentecost. Peter was transformed with Pentecost. A Peter who was scary, who denied Jesus, was transformed on the day of Pentecost. It is the Pentecost that transforms you. Yes, Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. See, this is com combination, joy and the Holy Spirit. Disciples with joy and the Holy Spirit. It cannot be separated. It goes side by side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If your hands are working, please lift your hands and say hallelujah. One or two, whatever that is working, it doesn't matter. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I usually see only when they are paralyzed. So keep it going. Hallelujah. Because there's no neurosurgery in heaven, only hallelujah in heaven. I want to remind every of you, every one of you to say hallelujah and rejoice. It doesn't matter what you're passing through, but you start singing and praising and rejoicing in God. It will change. Situation will change. John chapter 15 verse 11, Jesus is start telling something. John chapter 15 verse 11. When Jesus says, they are all red-lettered word. When Jesus says uh, something, it's very important. I have two more verses and I'll close the message. Uh, John chapter 15 verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus is saying my joy in you and your joy will be complete. So the joy doesn't become complete without Jesus in us and the joy of Jesus in us. So God wants, Jesus wants that his joy will remain in us and become complete in us. In two, two Old Testament verses, Jeremiah 31, 13 and Isaiah 51, 11, let me read that and close this message for you. Jeremiah 13, 13 is a message where I think every one of us should read in between markets and uh, Remember it once in a while. Jeremiah 13, 31, 13. 3, 1, 13. 31, 13. That's something which we must keep pondering in between to see what God wants to tell you through that verse. Because this is something that only God can do. Then young women will dance and be glad. Young men and old as well. Yes. I will turn, turn their mourning into gladness. I will turn their mourning into God gladness. And? I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. Yes! That's a message. I will turn their mourning into gladness. You've been grieving too long. You've been sorrowful too long. You've been crying too long. I will turn their mourning into gladness. Believe it. Receive it. Don't cry, don't grieve, don't be mourning, but receive it. I will, God says, I will turn their mourning into joy. It's God's plan in your life. This morning God is speaking to someone. Receive that. It is God's plan in your life that he will turn your mourning into joy. And finally, from Isaiah 51 verse 11. This, I love this verse and I read it often. Because I really enjoy reading this verse. Isaiah 51 verse 11. I hope you have read it at least once in your life. Isaiah 51 verse 11. 
Those the Lord has rescued will return. Those the Lord has rescued. Who are they? We are the ones who are rescued from sin. They will return. Where will they return? They will enter Zion. Zion, the city of God. Right now you are in the presence of God, the city of God. They will enter Zion. And when you come to Zion, what happens? They will enter Zion with singing. Singing! You can't come to church crying. You come with crying, go back singing. Okay? You will enter Zion with singing and then? Everlasting joy will crown It's called the heads. everlasting joy. Not temporary joy. The everlasting joy. So rejoice in the Lord means rejoice always. Everlasting joy will be upon their heads. Head. Yes. Gladness and joy will overtake them. Gladness and joy will overtake them. Means go before them. Gladness will overtake. Joy will overtake them. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Flee away from your family, from your home, from your personal life, from every situation. What will flee away? Sorrow and sighing. <gasps> will flee away. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. Yes. And you will get a garment of praise instead of spirit of heaviness. May God enable each one of us this morning to really rejoice in God's presence and enjoy what he has given. Thank you all and God bless you. Thank you. Let's have a little conversation. It's so refreshing to...